Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. I am so excited to be here with Sabrina and Jared. Um, for those of you who don't know, Sabrina Carpenter is um, an actress, producer, and singer. She is currently shooting in Atlanta. Um, she's shooting Emergency for Amazon and recording an album. And next up is Alice, um, a Netflix series a Netflix film that she is producing and starring in, and that's in pre-production. Um, and Jared Tingle is a founder and partner at Harlem Capital. Um, this year, he completed his second fund of $134 million, um, which he raised from the likes of Apple, PayPal, and TPG Capital, uh, all to invest in women and people of color. So I'm so glad um, that you're both here. And I think that both, all three of us wondered when we got the fact that you two were on the stage together is is this right like well, what do these people have in common and I think that you know what it came down to is both of you have had the best year yet this year in the pandemic and I um think that you know that's unexpected especially for Hollywood and finance or VC two industries that have more or less slowed down this year so um I would love to hear a little bit about where each of you were, um, you know, last March um, and what you were thinking when the, when the pandemic struck. Jared, you want to take this one first? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, so we were living the good life, I think, February and March of 2020. Uh, we closed our first fund in November of 2019. So we were done with that. We were ready to just meet people, have fun, throw events and just enjoy life and invest in great companies. We actually had an event for Black History Month at Facebook at the end of February. We had a speaking circuit, flying to LA, SF. Then a pandemic happened. Um, we were early in trying to assess what was going on. VCs were pretty early. Um, you know, Andrews in particular, they were looking at Asia. They shut down their office early. And you tend to be ahead of trends. So I saw it coming, didn't realize it would be such a big deal. But I think once the NBA shut down is when we just stopped doing everything and just didn't go to conferences and we're like all right let's bunker down let's get some groceries and let's just try to continue to run our business fortunately we were remote before and so we didn't have a disruption but we were scared we didn't know how it affect our companies us or or anybody personally and you were in new york too sabrina Yes. Yeah, similarly, it's funny. You were like, once the NBA shut down for me, it was once Broadway shut down because I was doing Broadway. Um, I had made my Broadway debut in Mean Girls um, for, I want to say it was two nights. Yeah, I got to do two shows and then and then the shutdown kind of happened. And being in New York, I'm sure you can agree it was like kind of a big cultural shock for everything to be that, um, you know, rapidly shut down. And I think it put a lot into perspective and a lot of people were then forced into kind of like internalizing themselves and going home or, or, you know, figuring out their home situations or not being able to be with their family or being able to be with their family. Um, it was tricky for, for mental health for a lot of reasons. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful that through technology and through everything that we've been able to kind of do over the last year to kind of keep going and keep giving people hope through, um, just persevering, I guess, through all of it and, and still being able to kind of, be open and be creative to, to create opportunities for ourselves and others um, in a time where a lot of people were struggling. But yeah, no probably for me right now, so. Yeah, but it, I mean, both of you were riding high. You definitely thought, you know, your March, April, May, June would go very differently than it ended up doing. And, and um, if you could each kind of go into a little bit about uh, the moment when you realized, oh, we're gonna have to kind of change our plan. Um, you know, Jared, you know, when you were like, okay, we're going to have to raise a second fund. And Sabrina, when you kind of decided, Hey, I'm going to have to, I want to maybe produce like this, this good happened out of both of these situations. Definitely. I'm happy to start. Um, Don't worry. I'm always like, I'm just going to look at I'm you. Happy to start. I mean, <laughs> you know, we stopped, we stopped traveling, you know, we stopped doing much social. And so that was the biggest adjustment. I'm a parent. And, you know, us and our nanny decided that we should part ways. And it was extremely tough. So now I'm trying to run my business while being with the kid. That was really tough. Um, we were able to keep the business going. We just switched everything to Zoom. But like personally, it was, it was, it was not great. Like I didn't do anything for fun. I wasn't seeing people. You come to New York City to be social and I'm stuck in my thousand square foot apartment like with nowhere to go. Like, is it safe to go to the grocery store? Is it safe to go to the laundry room? Like, I don't know. 
And it, there was a couple months in there where we just didn't know anything. Like, do you, is it spread by a handshake? Is it spread by breathing? Like no one knows. And so I just didn't do anything. Wait, uh, and even, I'm going to stop you for one second. Yeah, a thousand square feet is like a mansion in New York. <laughs> it's not bad. I'm not, I'm not in Midtown or anything. So I have a little more space, but it's still not a lot for most people in the country. Fair, fair. I think, yeah. I mean, honestly, at that point, I feel like, as you said, like it was just such an interesting time to sit back and observe our lives over the last year before all that happened and then kind of realize that maybe we took a lot of things for granted, um, like hugging and shaking people's hands and having in-person conversations, being closer than six feet and being able to go um, share experiences with people. For me, a lot of it had to do with, you know, live music, live shows. Um, so I think in that time, I really just like, the the passion for producing had always been there because I think especially with my music side of things I'm very much self uh, produced in a lot of ways like I'm very involved and kind of at the at the head of the ship on everything I do and very much love to just have a purpose behind every single thing that I'm doing and, and be very detail oriented so I think that time was like the perfect time I realized I was like wow like films, I mean, TV, um, stories, uh, a lot of people are looking to those things to bring them light and bring them, you know, any sense of hope or joy. And, and in my mind, you know, producing doesn't just go into like, oh, I want to create roles for myself to play, but it really goes into, I want to create roles for a lot of people to play, especially that I can't necessarily portray every character. Um, and, and I want to create those, that space for different artists to be able to tell those stories. And then obviously space for myself to, to create more complex female characters and, um, hopefully provide some hope for people in this transitional phase, once we're getting out of all of this now, but, um, that's kind of how the, the passion for producing began in quarantine. Jared, what about you kind of, um, similarly to Sabrina, you kind of took matters into your own hands. Um, before the pandemic, though, um, you graduated Harvard Business School and Wharton, and you could have probably had any job at any VC firm that you wanted, but rather than do that, you decided to start your own. And I'm so curious about, about that story a little bit. Sure. I couldn't have gone anywhere. It's, it's still really tough to recruit because <laughs> these firms are maybe taking one person per year max, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But I think the, the biggest thing for me was I was working at a private equity firm before. It's a black owned firm. And for me, I always saw myself being able to work for someone. But until that point, I'd never been around people that looked like me that were running a, a firm. And so that I, it opened my eyes. Um, I thought about recruiting and it was going OK. But really what changed was getting coverage from the press about Harlem Capital. So before that, it was a hobby. It was part time. It was for fun. We did get some early coverage from Forbes which just showed us that, you know, it could be something. And so instead of doing an internship, we decided to try to raise a fund and it was very hard. Like we got beat up, you know, took some ego hits, got embarrassed, you know, harmed some relationships ultimately, but we were able to persevere and get it done, focusing on our mission of, of backing black Latino women founders who, who need capital and just need access to be able to make their dreams come true. And what are some of the companies or wins that you've had in the last year that you're most excited about investing in? Um, sure. We actually found our best companies during the pandemic. Um, so with just being through Zoom, not meeting in person, we were able to find some great people, largely in part because we just were active on social. Maybe not as active as Sabrina, but we're, we're active on social. <laughs> um, so one company is called Cash Drop. It's a mobile e-commerce platform that enables small, medium-sized business owners to just run their shop. You can just do it on your phone. You don't need a laptop and it's a very favorable fee structure. So we're super excited about that. We have another company, they're based in Chicago, another company called Wellery uh, based in New York and they're focused on nutrition. So not dieting, but nutrition. How do people have a healthy relationship with food? Founders incredible. I think they're doing something that's very important because we all can have better relationships with food and it's been super exciting to see them grow. They've been growing 50% month over month uh, and hopefully they have a big follow on around. And Sabrina, what about for you, some of the, the things during the pandemic that you kind of accomplished in terms of your producing career? If you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, having those meetings with Netflix over Zoom. Yeah, well, I was having uh, meetings at that point. So, you know, having this idea and kind of needing to be able to pitch it to multiple different people that you would, you would usually do those meetings in person. And in general, you get um, such a better sense of 
everything, I think, in person when you have, we were talking about this earlier, but when you have, you can see people's body language, you can really understand who they are as people, you can get, um, you can emote a lot more, I think, than, than here. Um, but we've been able to obviously overcome so much of that and be able to like really understand this and, and how we're using it. And for me, I was on, you know, m- sometimes two to three hour long Zooms um, every day with different uh, with different film companies. And I think, you know, Netflix was obviously uh, people that I worked with before that I love so, so much, um, but it might have not necessarily been the right fit for them. Um, there was a lot of other great choices. And I think at the end of the day, like I just knew that these people would bring that specific project to life um, in a way that I really trusted and was super excited about. Um, but I think that's what's been so incredible is I've really just been opening the door and uh, and being able to kind of look through a wider lens at the fact that there's really not a whole lot of um, things that are limiting in this specific world, as far as creativity goes, like, you know, you really can accomplish anything that you put your mind to. You really can like have a small idea and it can turn into something so much bigger. Um, and that's what I've just been having so much fun with now is like, I'm reading so consistently and just, you know, kind of finding new opportunities to, to be able to bring new things to life with different distributors. And I've been so privileged to be able to work with, with some really great people. And and one thing you mentioned, and it, it reminds me of what Harlem Capital is doing a little bit, is that there's like a purpose, um, especially for you, for fem- complex female characters in your um, what you produce. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and kind of why you thought that was felt that was important? I think I was reading a lot of uh I guess if I'm coming from my own place, like I was reading a lot of roles for myself and, and a lot of the female roles at my age. And, you know, I guess I'll be playing like 15 for a couple more years. Cause mm-hmm. I look so young. Um, but mm-hmm. like roles from like 15 to 25, like some of these roles felt very contrived and they felt very, um, they felt, I don't know, a little boxed in to, to what people think that that age is or what people think women are experiencing at that age and less of what they are actually experiencing. Um, and so that kind of struck the idea of me being able to be like, oh, wow, like I I would love to just be able to create what I'm feeling and what I know so many people are feeling. And um, hopefully someone in this world can can watch that and feel inspired and feel a little less alone in their own circle. Um, And then, like I said, it kind of dove into the other world where I was reading books that didn't have roles for me at all. And I was reading stories about um, characters that were experiencing, you know, their own sexuality and coming out. And I was experiencing, you know, characters that were dealing with, um, you know, code switching in their own environments and, and wanting to be able to like tell those stories but maybe I'm not necessarily the person to tell those stories but I could still be involved in helping somebody else tell those stories so um it's all come from a place of just pure love for for storytelling um and and that's what I'm really focused on right now Jared what about you and obviously the purpose is kind of built into Harlem Capital why did you feel that was so important and also how did you kind of take the leap because it's a little bit it's it's not the traditional VC and it can was, you know, raising money in a non-traditional VC is not easy. So kind of how did you take that leap and why was it so important? Sure. The purpose really just found us. Um, you know, we had been in finance, had been in investing, and we just saw that there's this amazing tool for wealth creation that a lot of people are just locked out of and don't have access to. Um, even our firm that was diverse ran before, they didn't have diverse investments. And so that's what we were focused on. And our mission has enable us to take that leap. So even if it never made sense on paper when we're starting out, we're like, hey, if there's a way to do it, let's try to get it done. And that kept us going every single day throughout the highs and lows. So that's one thing that that we were focused on. And um, one more question before we go to audience questions, because we have a ton is, um, how does being on the younger side of both of your industries, especially young in terms of kind of being in control, whether it's producing or running the fund, how is that an advantage, um, whether it is social media or whatever, or just kind of flexibility? How has that been an advantage for you guys? Jared? Sure, I can start. Um, yeah, I mean, we have energy. That that helps. Uh, <laughs> and I think whenever you're doing something entrepreneurial, you have to be prepared to fail. And if you don't have, like, a mortgage and, like, five kids and ties, like, you can just take more risk and focus on whatever you're trying to accomplish. So you can be an entrepreneur anytime, but like you just have this window where you can really go after it. I think we use that 
you know, social media is so powerful. Like, you know, we talk about Instagram and Facebook, but like Twitter and LinkedIn are so underutilized that if you use those platforms well, it's a way to amplify. Instead of talking to, you know, one or a dozen people at a time, you can talk to literally hundreds of thousands of people at a time. It's distribution. And I think, you know, the younger people get that. And you don't have to be a celebrity. It's great for celebrity and you can use that, but you can also just be a thought leader or somebody who's something interesting and you can find your audience and you can use it as a way to connect with folks. So we met some of our best founders, some of our best connections through social media, and we'll just continue to double and triple down on it. And that's an advantage we have being young, digitally native people. I was about to say, like being young, like I definitely know how to use social media more than my elders. Um, not not that well. I will be. I sometimes I have my moments that I definitely I mess up. But um, it's so true. I think I think there's a lot less like um, archaic ways that we are sticking to and formats that have been done time and time again. That you know, um, I think. There's so many opportunities now for us to be able to step outside the box of what everyone's been doing and what's been done before. And I've just seen, I guess, because I, I started, um, I signed with my label when I was 12 years old. And I think um, throughout, you know, those years of, of kind of creating at the same time as I was also figuring out who I was as a young woman and just like growing, I had a lot of people telling me like, this is how you need to do things. This is the right way to do things. This is like, you know, you take this step and then it's this step. And then every single time that I was like, but what if I don't want to take that step? What if I want to try this? And what if I want to do something that might be riskier, but it might it might feel more organic to me. Um, that was always the time that it that it translated to people, and that you know the people that were watching what I was doing, uh, I think felt more connected to me as an artist. I don't know. I'm just I'm just guessing, but I I really have always felt like the more that I was doing things that felt um, less you know formulated, the, the the better it was. And I think young people have that really incredible ability to just be a little bit more fearless. Like you said, we don't have like you know I guess years and years of things weighing us down we definitely have more metabolism we definitely have five hour energy shots we definitely will take those and we will get work done um and work ethic is a big thing and i i've just been so grateful to like be surrounded by so many young people that are um not waiting for things to be handed to them on a silver platter but are really really able to go out there and make it happen for themselves and i'm so inspired by by that yeah and i i do think like hustle is something that definitely diminishes as you age and even sometimes I think back to like myself five years ago and I wish I had a little bit more of that like hustle mentality <laughs> I know balance is good but um maybe, I do maybe not <laughs> you, know, thing, like, you get better as you get wiser the, the good, like I have hopefully you know knock on what I have a long career in this so it helps to start early but you also benefit from years in the game so I don't want to knock on on the older people yeah <laughs> No, no, no. Not that either. Oh, yeah. Hopefully they know that their experience has obviously guided us. Um, but I think now it's like it's exciting to be able to try new things and to be able to uh, see what new opportunities we can create with like a different kind of generation that we're growing up in, you know? Yeah. And that leads us to a couple of our questions, which is uh, we have some younger people, obviously, in the audience. Um, it's all young people, which is um for Jared, um, what advice do you have for young people looking to pursue big dreams and goals if then in the face of adversity, the, especially the, those that face adversities for being part of the minority? Ooh, good question. Uh, be you, right? Like, I think there's pressure to conform sometimes, but like, you'll be happiest when you bring your full self to work. I think the best thing anyone can do is get mentors. Um, and get sponsorship. And so find people that have done what you want to do. Uh, if they look like you or not, it doesn't matter. But so much of it is like people opening doors. So I think the better you are at like marketing yourself, uh, asking for what you want and just getting good advice can help you. And you can't take all advice, but you will be better off, you know, having people that are, are kind of pushing you and, and being sponsorship for you. And then Sabrina kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, and I would love for, for both of your thoughts on this, but I'll start with you is, do you ever take, deal with older, more experienced, either entrepreneurs or people in either industry not taking you seriously or treating you like you're incompetent? I think that this happens to younger people and women. So I'm sure that you have. Um, and I'm curious if you have any advice for that. And you as well, Jared. Yes. Uh, short answer. I think I've experienced that in more ways than one of just, you know, they're having that preconceived notion of your abilities. Um, and, and it 
yeah, I definitely, I think being a young woman has made that harder, but I think just in general, being a young person, I struggled with that. I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that just, like I said, they will kind of be stuck in these traditional ways and they're scared of things that are new. And a lot of people are scared of change in general. Um, and I think that when you're someone young that has such a big imagination and you want to bring change to the table, it can be a little intimidating for yourself, but also for other people. Um, I tried not to let that get in the way. I've always been someone that's been very determined and I'm very lucky um, to, to be that way. But I think for younger people that maybe aren't or are a little bit more um, hesitant to know which way to turn in those situations where people are trying to kind of limit you, it's best to really just trust yourself. Like the voice inside you will never steer you wrong. And whether it's taking you down a path that is, you know, maybe supposed to take you down a path just to teach you a lesson. It might not be like, this is the answer to all your problems. It might just be there to lead you to the next great thing. Um, so I think slow and steady is really important, but yes, definitely dealt with that, still dealing with it. Um, and it's a learning process. And what, what about you, Jared? Yeah, no, I mean, if, if you're young or you're in the minority, it's always gonna be tougher, but it's never been easier at the same time, right? Like we have actual information, it's cheaper than ever to start a company or to start, I don't know if it's, start, it's cheaper to start producing films, but like there's so much at your fingertips now because you have your phone, your computer. So utilize that. And we're in an age where you don't necessarily need the gatekeepers and the people to stamp your way in. You can go on YouTube, you can get a camera, you can like start a business, you can start, you know, producing content on your own. And so I think focus on the tools you have and don't wait for it. Like you can go ahead and, and do it yourself. There's so much out there now between TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, you can just be a thought leader and you may not even need a resume or, or a checkbox from any significant institution. You can go ahead and do it yourself. And on that note, um, we will go and people can start creating that content and get on their phones, start making plans for their businesses. Um, I really appreciate you guys joining us. Um, and I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of the programming this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Great guys. to be here. Thank you.